Good afternoon, everybody. You've uh, joined us for the deep dive. Uh, this is the Zoom deep dive featuring our national expert on livable street systems, Mr. Wade Walker. And uh, I'm Victor Dover. I'll tell you more about my role in this in, in a few minutes. But first, let's turn to Commissioner Daniel Williams for a word of introduction from the city of Lake Wales. Thank you so much, uh, Victor. My name is Daniel Williams. I'm a commissioner, and I'm so pleased to welcome all of you to our online session on the behalf of the city of Lake Wales. Along with the other city commissioners, I'm very excited that we've been taking on the process to create Lake Wales and Vision, a long-range plan we very much need. And to create this plan, we need all hands on deck. Our consultants with Dover Cole, as well as Well Walking and Associates, have a very interesting discussion for us today. And I just want to thank all of you again for logging in. Victor Dover from Dover Cole and Partners Town Planning, it is now in your hands. Thank you, Commissioner. Today's event is part of Lake Wales Envisioned, which as the Commissioner described is a big planning initiative to chart a better course for Lake Wales as it grows and changes over the coming century. Uh, my name is Victor Dover. I'm a town planner and urban designer. And our firm has been assigned this awesome responsibility to work with your city staff, your elected leaders, your citizens, and your business people to take a hard critical look at the way the city is growing up physically and to come up with better ways to reconcile that with your incredible history and your sense of place and your unique economic opportunity. Today's event is part of an ongoing series, including a similar deep dive on conservation, the environment, and the big green network we had last week. You can find recordings of, of all of the sessions, both in person and online, that have occurred and will occur in the future at lakewalesenvisioned.com. Just one quick reminder, today's session is being recorded, and by attending, you're consenting to being part of that recording. So if you would, please make a note to yourself to let others know uh, that we're doing this, because there's lots of good information in these sessions, and you want to spread that as far and wide as we can. During our session today, you can type your comments and your questions into the chat, and we will use whatever you type in to have a dialogue with Mr. Walker. We may call on some of you to unmute and uh, elaborate on what you've uh, gotten started, but go ahead and type questions and comments into the chat as we go. A couple of folks from our team, Amy Groves, uh, who's the project director for this effort, and Eric Pate, working alongside myself and Amy, uh, will be monitoring that as we go. And then Amy will moderate a dialogue at the, at the end. I want to pause for a second to thank our local and statewide partners for their continued support in creating the Lake Wales Envision Plan. This is not just a city effort anymore. We have a whole coalition of folks who have joined in with their organizations, including nonprofits and our universities, uh, including the Chamber of Commerce and others. Uh, to help make this plan possible. Uh, you'll notice that our big NASCAR jacket of logos has added one more this week. Um, John Zimmerman from Active Towns Initiative, a national uh, group that a non-government or organization that is promoting culture of healthy uh, physical daily activity has joined in on this effort. It couldn't be more timely because today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about streets where we not only drive back and forth, but we can get our exercise and get to know our neighbors. So thank you, John Zimmerman, for being the latest addition uh, with Active Towns to our co-sponsors. Uh, our agenda today is pretty simple. We'll do these introductions. Well, I'll give you a quick rundown on the Lake Wales envisioned to date and where we stand. Then uh, Mr. Walker will take over with our deep dive on complete streets and mobility, after which we'll have some time for a discussion on whatever you bring up tee up those topics in the task, in the chat. And we'll task Wade Walker with your questions. Now Wade is with the firm Kittleson Associates. He's part of the team for Lake Wales Envisioned and he'll lead most of our conversation today. Wade is a professional transportation engineer. They used to call him traffic engineers. He'll probably tell us why that's changed. But Wade is helping our team create a strategy for, for the future of moving around in the city of Lake Wales. Uh, that goes hand in hand with our efforts in land conservation or neighborhood building or historic preservation. Uh, but uh, you'll find that Wade's experience is gonna be very valuable for all of us because he's worked with municipalities all over the country, 
to help bring balance to their modern transportation systems. Now, for those who haven't been following this, just a quick reminder, Lake Wales Envisioned is the city's plan to guide growth and conservation throughout the city and beyond uh, into its ut surrounding utility service area. That's the big uh, egg yolk color there around uh, the map of the incorporated city. So that's shown here and you know, for over the coming decades, the city will have decisions about what land should or should not be annexed, what should remain in conservation uh, or agriculture, uh, where do they provide water and sewer and other utilities and municipal services. That area covers over 40,000 acres. So when we began this effort, your city commission adopted a series of aspirations. We call them the initial aspirations because they're being checked and discussed one by one as we go through this process. Today, uh, we're gonna talk about two of them. Number six on our list of eight aspirations says, we will seek to make traditional neighborhoods with walkable connected streets that create a high quality public realm, the norm. Now I think the key word here is norm, not, not the exception to the rule. Uh, walkable, connected streets. Now, number eight gets even more specific. It says, we will grow a livable transportation network by implementing the Lake Wales Mobility Plan and including context-sensitive, complete streets. There's a lot there, and Wade Walker will talk to us about what that means. For those who haven't been following along, we began this effort in March with a kickoff symposium and community meeting. Um, we covered a lot of subjects, including how to build great neighborhoods, how to uh, boost economic development and add value by building well, and about conservation and the environment. Interestingly, we asked folks a lot of questions during that process and during our uh, kickoff reception. Uh, we turned to people with, uh, and in uh, Saturday morning to join in small groups for hands-on, uh, designing in public, community input. We worked for several hours over maps uh, in these small groups and then had the groups come back and report on what was most important to them. But here are some of our notes from those uh, conversations. We wrote down uh, what people from those groups said and they brought up uh, questions like what you see here. That open space was important and infill is where the priority for development should occur. And then some of the comments that we made notes about were very specific to transportation and street design. Uh, people said that some of the streets are like raceways or too wide. They're like the Indianapolis 500. People said, can we slow down the traffic and calm it? Can we add more street trees and sidewalks and on-street parking? Uh, those are the kinds of things we were hearing. And the comments about transportation went beyond streets. They also talked about trails and greenways and the non-motorized uh, part of our street network. During the week that followed the, the initial hands-on session in April, we had an on-location design studio. Meetings continued, big maps were rolled out, uh, lots of illustrations were made, what-ifs were explored, and then um, at the end of that week, on the 20th of April, we gathered at the Art Center for a look at the work in progress. Uh, uh, basically, we asked everybody to put their pencils down and put their drawings up on the big screen so that the larger audience could check them out. And you can watch on the YouTube channel or at lakewellsenvision.com uh, a uh, recording of that event. You can watch the whole hour plus long thing or you can watch the uh, nine or ten minute recap that Eric uh, Pate recorded in the days that followed. Now, before we get started, since we're going to be talking about transportation and traffic and walking and biking, ways of getting around, just to set the stage, I want to bring up one important reminder I hope we'll all keep in mind while we get into all that technical stuff, and that's this, that our streets are more than just transportation facilities. They are, or at least they should be, our addresses. You know, addresses for our homes and our businesses and our institutions for our, they're the living place for our families, human habitat. You know, historic Lake Wales shows this idea so well. Our streets are where our impressions of the city are formed. You know, it should instantly look to us like this is a human habitat. And you know, as you've probably observed in your lifetime, 
We've lost track of that a bit back in the second half of the 20th century. And in many places, not just in Lake Wales, but all over the Sunshine State or all over the Sun Belt, you might think this is a place where cars live instead. We're going to challenge Mr. Walker on this question. Is it, can the streets accommodate our cars without making us feel like we're dominated by them as if they are the dominant species? Now, when we get it right, like the founders did, we make streets into places where people want to be, where we have great experiences, where we form our best memories of the place. Historic Lake Wales, and this could be whether you're on one of the streets with the big grand houses, or on one with modest bungalows, or on one of the streets with both of those, um, you'll find that those places in Historic Lake Wales beautifully presented this idea that neighborhoods, not just subdivisions, could be places where people get to know their neighbors. They, instead of garage door after garage door, the traditional Lake Wales way was to greet the public space of the street with stoops and porches and front doors and storefronts and balconies. And in proud traditional towns, those ideas of street-oriented architecture and neighborhood carry over from our places of residence to our workplaces and our places of commerce too. Uh, like that other Park Avenue, the one in Winter Park, seen here. A group of us that are helping you these days in Lake Wales with your Park Avenue, including Wade's former firm, redesigned that famous street in uh, Winter Park, Park Avenue, a couple of decades ago. And if you haven't seen it, please go see it. Let us know what you think. It seems to be doing pretty well. But when you go downtown in Lake Wales now and you see all the construction activity on your Park Avenue, that's actually part of the Lake Wales Connected Plan that led to what we're doing today with Lake Wales Envisioned. And get ready. It's going to be a dramatic improvement. Uh, just, you know, just really from thinking of it, again, as a people-first public space. Now, the best streets in a town, are, I think they're designed to be places where people come together, interact naturally, you know, not just in Zoom, but in person. And when we get them right, they naturally encourage us to get outside and get our recommended daily exercise. And they're welcoming. They're welcoming to people in cars, but also to those who are on two wheels. There's me riding my bike, uh, whether on a bike or in a wheelchair. When we get streets right, they can do so much more. Simple things like lining up street trees can transform these transportation facilities into scenes of beauty, works of art in a way. Um, and they can also be the kinds of addresses that gracefully allow for us to invite new folks to live among us, not just with strong property values, but with dignity. And that's the challenge. And with that reminder of just how great streets can really be with a new Lake Wales way for the 21st century, it's time to talk with our transportation engineer. I'll turn it over now to our colleague, Wade Walker. Thank you, Victor, and uh, th thank you for that inspiration, and now we're going to crash right back to reality. Um, those of you that uh, on your way to your Zoom meeting, did you, uh, did you have to, were you stuck in traffic? Uh, you know, we've all been stuck there south of I-4 on US-27, uh, on State Road 60. Um, we've all been there. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, we may ask ourselves, why is this happening? Why am I stuck in traffic all the time? Well, we're going to peel back the curtain of the traffic engineers, transportation engineers, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that all of you are just dying to hear the answer to this. Next slide, please. It's not that easy. It's not that easy to answer because it's not just about one thing, but it's all it's really about land use and the way that we design our streets and the way that with it being uh, network versus isolated streets but it's about the design, the way that they look, and it's also about the process. Historically, what we have done as transportation engineers and planners is look first at the um, anticipating land use that's going to happen, then make forecasts based on that land use. We can equate certain amounts of development to certain amounts of traffic, and then start to plan the, the roadways to accommodate that expected traffic volume doesn't always happen that way. Illustration that I'm showing, imagine a small town such as Lake Wales on, uh, you know, on, on, the, on the, the state highway system. And imagine that being uh, orange groves 
all around there. Well, at some point, maybe those groves start to be houses. And you'll see that they're located a little bit out of town because people didn't want to be right in town. That may have been where the grove was located. And so we, we plan that. And then we to accommodate that, we end up having to widen the only road into town so that people can actually get there to get their goods and services. Um, so they have to drive into town. What we didn't really anticipate is once we do that, then we start to see this ancillary development happening that's starting to capture those cars. Not necessarily the people, but you know, retailers look at the amount of cars that are on a corridor when they make a decision to want to go there. So now we end up with the big parking lots and the services that are doing uh, selling things that people need a little bit closer to their houses, not quite in town, and people can actually uh, get there. However, maybe we didn't anticipate all of that development happening. And so therefore, it becomes this cycle where now we've got to widen the road uh, again to be able to accommodate um, all of that. So this cycle goes on and on um, until we end up with situations like you see as you get closer to I-4 uh, on US-27, where it seems like every little thing that goes in, whether it be something very, very small, can cause these exponential uh, delays, and it, it feels like you're sitting in traffic forever. So those are the things that, uh, so good news is we do have a remedy for that. And it really comes down to, we start flipping the way we think about this and the way we do our transportation planning. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make a decision that all of our transportation investments are going to be multimodal and they're gonna be networked. So they're gonna be connected and they're going to be, when I say multimodal, I mean, people have choices other than just a personal motor vehicle. There's bicycles, there's being able, being able to walk safely, being able to cross the street, being able to use uh, transit. Um, and then, you know, the contraptions that we see with the, uh, with the scooters and the, um, the, even the one wheels that I'm fascinated by um, can be accommodated on the streets. We're going to manage that travel. So we're going to bring land uses closer and mix them in so that that travel, we have a combination of short trips. So we have the ability to make those shorter trips that could be more conducive to walking and biking. Uh, and we're going to bring things closer. And it's one of the things that we're talking about in Lake Wales and Vision. And it really comes down to, it's a coordinated transportation land use strategy. And so what happens when we, when we do that? Next slide, please is that we can start to see the returns. And this slide really shows what happens. So that top slide is that first piece that I talked about where we're looking at uh, and, and kind of how we've been doing it for years, uh, not, only in, not only in Polk County, but like Victor said, many other places around the state and around the Southern US is we've isolated our land uses. We've created these pods that have very limited connectivity in that the yellow would represent houses, the purple represents schools or, or churches, the red represents commercial, the green represents um, open space and so, or parks. So one thing to note about that is you see all of these streets that don't really seem to go anywhere except to one place. They go right out on that main road, similar to the one that we illustrated earlier. A different way of looking at it, and what we're talking about within Lake Wales, uh, within Lake Wales and Vision, is the bottom part of that slide, being able to really look at it more from a standpoint of mixing those uses, shorter trips, and interconnected network. Now, what does that mean when we when we start to look at those two um, those two scenarios? Well, the top scenario, whenever you start to make trips based on that you are having to make all of your trips to go see your friends in the next neighborhood over or go to the shopping center or go to the school. Most of those trips are ending up having to come right out on that road. And that's what's causing that issue of everything being right there and everything relying on that one spine road to get around. 
system is really more set up for longer trips and the street ends up being designed only for cars uh, and movement of cars and minimizing that delay. However, we start to look at the, um, the other scenario. And so if we start to mix the land uses, put commercial in, in close to houses, put the institution or put the schools closer to houses, tie in that big green network within these areas and connect it all with a walkable, with a network of walkable streets that are connected to each other, suddenly you don't have to rely on that one road. There's multiple ways of getting around, not only by car, but because things are set up more for those short trips, they can be, it, it really makes it a lot easier to walk or bike. And the other key piece is it allows you to really design streets for people, not just cars, because we want to facilitate that walking and biking uh, and, and also accommodating those automobiles, but not the, the car movement not being the be all end all uh, of that. So what we've really what we started doing is uh, we've started looking at context. So it this is a, an example of um, what Florida Department of Transportation is using, and it really goes back to a very clear urban design principle in that different areas have different needs. And so we look at the land use along what we call the transect, and we go from a very dense, like downtown um, Orlando or Tampa, uh, all the way out to the very natural areas like you see uh, around a lot of, of Lake Wales. Um, and then the rural areas, and then working into these small rural towns like you see uh, in, in Polk County, uh, and then into the more built up areas with uh, the residential. So we're starting to really design for the context uh, and, and uh, Florida DOT has taken this to heart and is really looking at trying to put the right street in the right place. And it's a lesson that, that I think as we are working through uh, Lake Wales and Vision, we want to make sure that we do that. So one of the ways that we can get those right streets in the right place, Victor talked, talked earlier about this idea of complete streets. And you probably heard the term. I know we used it a lot as we were working through uh, the charrette. But, um, you know, what are complete streets? And more importantly, why are they important? Well, the National Complete Streets Coalition, yes, there is such a thing, defines complete streets as they are streets for everyone. Notice it doesn't say streets for cars. It says streets for everyone. So it's personifying uh, what they're for. They're designed and operated to enable safe access for all users. Note that it does include motorists here, pedestrians, bicycle, motorists, and transit riders of all ages and abilities. This is very critical, um, especially in places like Lake Wales, where you have people from, you wanna be able to accommodate travel for people from eight to 80, so that they can be born in Lake Wales, they can grow up there, they can uh, live their life there and eventually retire uh, there um, and age in place. Complete streets make it a lot easier to cross the streets, being able to walk to things, uh, and, and being able to get to transit. So that's the definition of complete streets. But what do they actually look like? Well, I've got some examples on this next slide that actually show some examples. You see the one on the top uh, is Clematis Street in uh, downtown West Palm Beach. Uh, you know, big sidewalks, better accommodation for pedestrians. You see it does still carry cars, but it's engaging those cars and really controlling those cars in a lower speed environment. That's all done through design. Um, you can also do that on different on other streets. Let me go back just a second. Um, and we're accommodating things like bicycles. We're using shade. We're creating these places more for people rather than just cars. Next. So why is that important? Well, I don't think we all have a sign to carry around with us. So it, the design really does become important on what we're going to do and how we're going to make sure that we can complete the streets. 
And if you notice that in the uh, in this uh, in this graphic of of how you can create walkable places, right smack in the middle of uh, of these ten factor, these top ten factors, are things that are directly related to complete streets and street design. We don't want to short shrift the the things below, above, and below because all of those uh, are influenced by those. Um, we need to have the interconnectivity, we need to have the mixture of land uses, the small block size, and the way we design the street with the on-street parking, street trees, sidewalks, making them narrow, really managing those speeds, uh, create, we'll, we'll have the driver drive slower by design while still accommodating the, the, tra the car traffic that we need to be accommodated with. So it all works part and parcel uh, together. Next, word about speed and why we're, uh, whenever we're really trying to encourage walkability in street design, it's very, very important that we control the speed of the motor vehicles. The speed increases both the probability and the severity of any kind of crash that you can have. And like many things in engineering, this is not a linear relationship. You think, okay, well, if I if I increase the travel speed by one percent, then that injury, then the, that crash rate may uh, increase by two percent. So it does. However, the crash rate that would cause a severe or incapacitating injury that could affect somebody for the rest of their life increases by about three percent, and the chance that that that's going to be fatal increases by about 4%. So speed really does matter and we need to make sure that we get the street design right. Speed is that most, most important factor in injury severity. Um, this diagram is actually reproduced from a crash reconstruction manual. And what these different zones show is that is where a pedestrian that's struck by a vehicle, where the dent in the car from their head striking the car uh, would occur at different speeds. Crash reconstructors use this to determine how fast a car may have been going when they, when they hit a pedestrian. Um, one thing, this is a little bit of an older diagram, um, as cars are getting larger and that full frontal um, and, and the fronts of the cars are getting bigger, um, this changes because now you're being struck basically in the entire torso and the, in, the head injuries that are happening more frequently now are from where the pedestrian's head strikes the asphalt after it's shoved by the vehicle, after it's thrown by the vehicle striking it. So I know it's not exactly the, uh, the encouraging uh, to hear, but it really does get back to why speed matters. Again, not a linear relationship. Pedestrians uh, hit by a motor vehicle traveling at 20 miles an hour have about a nine out of 10 chance of survival. If that speed increases to 30, then 40, it goes down dramatically. Short answer, speed kills. And we need to make sure that our street design takes care of that and we're creating streets that are friendly to people and not just motor vehicles. And that means we have to slow down and complete the streets. As we started to work through Lake Wales Envision, we learned a lot of lessons from Lake Wales Connected uh, with regard to mobility. And the application may be a little different, but a lot of the tenants are still the same. So the goals that we have really looked at is number one, we wanna make sure that we have the right streets in the right places. Number two, they've gotta be safe and not just safe for motor vehicles, but safe for all of the users. Number three, we wanna make sure that these streets are designed for everyone, not just cars. We want to be able to accommodate all users of all ages and abilities. Number four, we have to make them beautiful. So we can make them beautiful, incorporating techniques to manage the speeds, connect them, facilitate these short, short trips, and do it all in what we've been calling the Lake Wales way. Thanks. So when we start on, when we start looking at all of those, we start to look at the streets. And you had in 2022, um, 
you adopted, you, you had a mobility plan that was done for the town and adopted, uh, completed by uh, New Urban Concepts. And it started to look at how can we make better connections and more connections? And you see a lot of these that are listed as complete street kinds of improvements. And so one of the things that we've tried to do through Lake Wales Envision is really articulate what that means in the different areas uh, of the utility service area. Next. So when we start to look at, you know, some of our favorite, some of our favorite roads, um, like State Road 60, um, down by uh, 11th Street and the, uh, the the existing shopping center on the uh, on the south side. Um, those of you that were at the charrette have seen this image that talks about in the future if you start to rethink and re envision uh, creating a neighborhood near here, uh, then you can start to provide that mix of different uses to be able to uh, to facilitate that. But what happens to State Road 60, uh, you know, we have to address being able to walk along uh, and be able to get across that street so that people can, uh, can get there. And one of the things to really think about is that we've got a golden opportunity with State Road 60, with US 27, with Scenic Highway in the next five years, in that all of those roadways are slated for resurfacing. And so a lot of the things that we can look at, FDO, Florida Department of Transportation, wants to hear what the community's visions are so that they can help you realize that and be able to get these kinds of things, such as enhanced pedestrian crossings, speed management through uh, landscape uh, and enclosure, and better pedestrian facilities incorporated into those projects. What we're showing here is a protected uh, crossing for State Road 60, not, not a vehicle signalized crossing, but more of a pedestrian crossing as well. We can also look at that on uh, US 27. And so, you know, take advantage of some of the, the median location that's there and uh, be able to create um, longer distance pedestrian connections because things that are open today, open land today, may not necessarily be so in the future. And we need to make sure that we start to set up to be able to facilitate uh, redevelopment or even new development along these larger, along these larger corridors. And so now is the time to be doing that so that we can articulate through Lake Wales and Vision, get these things into the, get these ideas into the planning process so that they can be implemented uh, at some point in the future. Next. We heard loud and clear that, uh, you know, one of the desires of the community was to protect the view shed. And, you know, nowhere do we really, nowhere do we have view sheds quite as precious as some of those along Scenic Highway. Um, see Bach Tower in the, in the background, this is north of, uh, just north of Lake Wales as you're coming into, as you're coming into the city. Um, one of the things though to understand, next slide, is that, the roadway, uh, scenic highway goes through a lot of different areas. So it's traversing in and out of, of cities and towns along the ridge uh, as it goes. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that we get the, the areas right and can start to inform design of how it's handled in the rural areas. And then as it starts to transition into, a, into one of the cities, how can we start to give cues and change the design to be able to facilitate an in-town scenic highway? This shows a transition zone where it would still maintain a 12-foot path, which could be part of the Ridge Scenic Trail, uh, introducing lighting, introducing curb and gutter, and then right in as you get into the heart of town, maybe things like on-street parking, uh, wider sidewalks, a little more formal uh, streetscape uh, as well. Next. One other thing that we looked at was uh, Burns Avenue. Um, and you know, this is a, an unflattering image of Burns Avenue. But uh, you know what we have today, we have five, uh, four through travel lanes. We have- uh, Wade. 
I just want to give you a little award for diplomacy. That was the most diplomatic way I've ever heard that uh, lurching spasm of asphalt ever described. Unflattering picture. No, it's impossible to take a flattering picture of Burns Avenue. I have to call you on that um, because of what happened to it. It got metastasized into what uh, even an affectionate traffic engineer could only call a U5L, a ubiquitous five-laner. And I know you're about to tell us we can do better. Absolutely, we can do better. And we actually took the cues on, on Burns from, um, from the Saturday morning hands-on session. Uh, we actually had a build-a-street diagram that used uh, a street just like that that said, like Burns Avenue, Spoiler, it actually was Burns Avenue that we used. Um, but one of the things that people really wanted to look at was how could we green it? How could we make it more green? How can we provide for other uses along there? How can we accommodate bicycles and a better accommodation for pedestrians where they're not baking in the sun with uh, no shade uh, and have lighting uh, at night? So we took those ideas and really started to rethink what Burns Avenue could look like. One thing to note here, this would not require complete reconstruction of the street. The curb is in exactly the same place that it was in the previous, uh, in, in the pre-condition. But what we've done is we've taken that, that width of the roadway and the width of the street, and we started adding in elements to facilitate better walking. We've added protected facilities for bicyclists so that now you can bike and you're not in traffic and in the outside lane of traffic. We've been able to green that center turn lane where it's not needed and provide landscaping uh, as well, and then being able to provide the shade. So pretty dramatic change from what is there today. So really being able to uh, better accommodate people, not just cars, but people, and really right-sizing that street to what, um, what it needs to be. Um, I don't think, I think we asked the question, do you think there's enough traffic on Burns Avenue to warrant the number, to require the number of lanes that are out there? I don't remember anybody saying, oh yes, we need all of those travel lanes to do that. So it's really looking at a street that may have been overbuilt or is no longer serving the purpose it was built for. And how do we rethink that to be able to accommodate all of these different uses, design it for people in the Lake Wales way? Next. And it's not just about the, the streets that are there today. It's also about the streets that we may have uh, tomorrow. So Victor talked about some new neighborhoods and making those interconnected neighborhoods. Well, we have to have streets for those as well. So we came up with some different street types, uh, what we call a palette of different street types. So uh, things that, um, you know, these rural roadway, these rural streets that you have that are going out through the, the orange groves um, and that are going to serve neighborhoods in the future. And then things that can serve, um, you know, different uses along the street. You'll see that there's accommodation for pedestrians. There's accommodation for there, there's lighting, accommodation for bicyclists, and then even getting into uh, other street types as well to serve single family residential, very low volumes, very low speeds. But again, accommodating all users, whether or not they want to be wrapped in two tons of steel or um, be on a bike or walking uh, within Lake Wales. Next. And it all comes together in, in places, uh, as Victor mentioned. So you may have seen this, uh, this image if you attended Dr. Exum's talk last week uh, of this idea of a conservation village. So you'll notice that that green swath can be part of the big green network. And you'll see the trail that, uh, that comes through there. Uh, as well that the residents of this new neighborhood can get to, can use, uh, and be able to get to uh, things within their neighborhood by either driving, walking, or biking, whatever their choice is. So it's comfortable, it's shady as well. 
when we talk about trails, um, you know, we heard a lot of interest in trails and the uh, mobility plan that was uh, completed uh, in 2022 actually looked at some of those um, trails and incorporated uh, a lot more of the uh, green network and, and trail network as well. And then we actually, in, in Lake Wales Envision, we've looked at augmenting that. So for instance, um, being able to create new connections to some uh, from, from the city to some of the uh, other amenities, such as some of the preserved areas and some of the, uh, some of the watersheds, such as Peace Creek. And this image shows that how a connection, a greenway along Peace Creek could connect into the planned Bar Total Lake Wales Trail. Uh, and also eventually connect up to the Ridge Scenic Highway Trail. So about creating, again, that interconnected network, it's not just about uh, interconnected street network. We, have, we should have an interconnected trail network as well. Thanks. And so this shows, uh, this is an idea of whenever you, you think about a trail in a, along a water feature such as uh, Peace Creek, what it could uh, you know what what it could look like it can provide these views and really get people into nature and get them into that big green network it's one of the things that we work very closely with dr exum and trying to integrate the uh, the trails and greenways <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, that we we have come to understand is that trails and greenways um, contribute significantly to the economic development of a of a place or, or of a city uh, people use these, they spend money, they, um, the, the upper right hand image is an image of the Swamp Rabbit Trail in upstate um, North Carolina, connects Greenville and Traveler's Rest and uh, has been a boon for the economies of, of both of them. Uh, and you see different contexts from out in the out in the woods to right in the middle of town. Final thing we're gonna talk about is the idea of a transit network. And uh, you know, you have the, you have transit service uh, within Lake Wales. There's a couple of, uh, couple of routes uh, that are currently running on fixed route service, but the mobility plan started to look at this idea of a transit connector or transit circulator. And one of the things that we're going to be doing, uh, you see connecting Bot Tower Garden to uh, Bach Tower Gardens uh, into Lake Wales and other, other destinations within the city. So, but one of the things that we would be looking at is how does this grow over time? So would you have an initial piece that might make that connection or serve, uh, serve residents uh, on certain times, maybe on weekends, maybe during the week? Um, and then how do you start to grow that system and what does it actually look like? So we'll be looking at some, uh, you know, various routing and staging for that as well. Um, and when we talk about multimodal in the, in the term of transit, we're not just talking about cars uh, or buses. We're talking about things like the, the scooters, the bikes, uh, and how they connect into the transit system. And then also looking at accommodating vehicles such as golf carts. We have a lot of communities that, uh, you know, golf carts are used to get around um, as well. So, you know, whenever we say streets for everyone, we do mean everyone. And we want to make sure that the network that we create uh, can accommodate all of those ways that people may want to get around. Um, not only are we, do we want to have a big green network, we want to make sure that we have a big mobility network but full of complete connected streets and trails and greenways. Uh, as well, so that people have a choice of how they move around Lake Wales. With that, I'll stop talking and uh, would love to entertain entertain questions and discussion. Great. Amy and Eric and we, have been monitoring. Amy, you take it away. Yep, we have um, some questions coming in um, through the chat, so we're going to start with those. And I guess, uh, Wade, the first one uh, that I saw there was a question about if you're going to be monitoring or looking at um, existing speed limits or making recommendations for speed limits for existing roads. One of the things that I think we've tried before is to just put up a new sign 
with a new speed limit without changing anything about the road or the street. And it really just doesn't work. Um, what we want to make sure that we do is if we identify how we want, how fast or how slow we want traffic to go, we need to make sure that we implement uh, measures to force drivers into that desired speed. And so in areas where we, where we plan on having a lot of pedestrians and bicyclists, it's going to be critical that we're looking at speeds in the range of, uh, you know, no more than 25 miles an hour uh, in those areas, because those are the places that we really want to make sure uh, that, that we, we accommodate that. So once we can do that, so what we want to do is let's figure out what speed we want people to go and then incorporate the design measures in that street to make sure that, they, that that's the speed that they actually do go through design. Another question came in about gated communities and wondering about gated communities that they block large areas and cause detours and especially for people walking and biking and how can the plan think about those areas? It, it's a little hard with things that are already there because, um, you know, you, it, it, it's, it's more difficult with places that are already there and, you know, gates are there for a reason and that people think that they want it to be isolated. Um, however, one of the things that we have seen time and time again is as trails go into, trails and greenways go into communities, and you'll have uh, people that that their subdivision backs up to the trail that will say, "Oh, we don't want that trail. We don't want the trail back there because you know, it's going to bring nefarious uh, influences, and people are going to ride up on bike and come into my backyard and steal my big screen TV and then ride off on their bike," um, which, which we know that doesn't really happen. But one of the things that we have really one of the things that we found that's been very interesting is that even in those communities where somebody has a fence or, or that, is, that comes right out onto or that backs up to that trail, when that trail goes in, within a couple of months, a lot of, uh, you see a lot of new gates on the back of those fences because the people that live there want to be, in, want to be able to access those trails. So there's ways to give access or give the residents access to facilities that are going to come closer to them, even if it is a wall gated subdivision. Uh, there may be some opportunities to provide some gates. There might be some easements that you can uh, get through between lots to be able to get people back there. Um, and, and so there, there's ways to do it. It is a lot more challenging. To, to get the, to get access within that already built environment that's not really set up for it, but 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 we we can look you know we can look at it. Great. This next question is asking about level of service or LOS, and is wondering if you can give an explanation about what that is, and is A actually a good grade for level of service? <laughs> Depends on a good grade for who. Cars love level of service A. People, not so much. Um, what level of service A, so as, as traffic engineers, um, I think we had a really good idea to assign grades to various levels of delay and congestion on roadways. And it goes A through F. Um, so, you know, immediately, one of the things that you think of is, oh, my gosh, we don't want a level of service F. That's like getting an F in school. And, you know, we certainly don't want that. We need to strive for A. Well, one of the things that happens when you strive for the higher or, or the higher end levels of service, because they're so geared toward reducing delay and therefore increasing speeds, is that you're creating facilities that may not be conducive to any other kind of travel. And quite frankly, wouldn't be that conducive to business as well, because people are going so, are driving through so fast that they're really not paying attention to what's on the side of the road um, as well. So one of the really interesting things, some of the streets that, that you think are very, very successful from a business standpoint, fail miserably from a traffic level of service standpoint. 
However, one of the things that, that we have started looking at is this idea of a quality level of service. So we're not only looking at that delay or, or that increment of vehicle delay, we're looking at how these streets can serve users that aren't in a car. So how comfortable are pedestrians? How, um, how comfortable are pedestrians? How comfortable are cyclists? How safe do they feel on these facilities? All of those things feel into that idea of the quality level of service. This is a common question because of that uh, common report card uh, set up with level of service A through F. And it's really common for newly elected elected officials, for example, to think, oh, well, then if I don't get an A, I did, I did it wrong. Uh, no, if you get an A, it means you traded down every other important value like fiscal responsibility. You, you spent way more than you should have. Uh, safety, uh, economic development, as you mentioned, you know, the quality, but also the property values of all adjacent property. You traded everything to try and get to that A, probably not even really getting there because we've all seen I-4, which was, of course, originally sized to get that free-flowing condition that would win them a, a good a score on the report card. It doesn't actually work. All it does is induce more travel and make it look like you're doing it wrong if you uh, make short trips or because things are close together or you walk and bike and use transit. So network is so much better than road widening in a, in a pursuit of the level of service. In fact, in, uh, in California, they joke that, that uh, LOS is really for level of stupidity because they tried in Los Angeles and in other places in the Bay Area um, to just keep widening roads to see if they could get that elusive level of service. And all they did was succeed in blighting their communities and, making, and inducing more travel and making things worse rather than better. So, uh, in fact, in California, you no longer have to even use that measurement for uh, the typical uh, development applications or, or um, government review of city plans, things like that. So we just don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that A is good and E is bad. In fact, E should stand for excellent and F might stand for fabulous because while they fail on paper in the computer for traffic, think about the places you know that have a grid of streets like downtown Winter Park. They're not choking on traffic because they're distributing all the trips that people are making at a bunch of different intersections and a whole series of smaller streets rather than just a few really wide ones. That means we're not all coming to the same intersection at the same time and causing it to fail. So a grid or a network, a web of streets is so much better for uh, facilitating traffic than trying to widen your road and you build up your intersection until you get a higher level of service. I think, I think we have all figured out that we're never going to widen our way out of traffic. Kind of like loosening your belt. To, to avoid obesity, you know, we're going to avoid obesity because we're going to lo loosen our belt. Very similar kind of thing. I've gotten a question earlier that asked, um, how much do all these types of improvements cost and who is going to pay for them? And I'm wondering if you can talk for a little bit about implementation and some of the ideas that we'll have as part of the plan. As far as cost, that's one, one of the things we're working through now. We'll have some preliminary number. We'll have some preliminary ideas uh, for some of these on um on on the for the July 11th uh, session um, that I, I guess uh, Amy I think you'll probably talk about that at the end of this uh, with next steps um, from a from a funding perspective it becomes really about partnerships and everybody is going to be able to, everybody's going to be able to pitch in or help uh, with different projects so you know the the, the street projects. Um, the new, the newer streets with new neighborhoods, a lot of the internal streets would be done as part of the development of that neighborhood. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that there's a really good opportunity to um, piggyback on the, these, these larger state roads that are slated for resurfacing um, in the coming years. And let's just get ahead. We just need to get ahead of it. Um, your local Florida Department of Transportation district, District 1 over in Barta, uh, has a group that wants to hear this. And they, they will, you know, they usually come to the communities and are more than welcome to, for the communities to come to them 
and tell them the kinds of things that they would be that that, that they would want um, when this these roadways are slated uh, for that. They've also really expanded the toolbox of what they can do uh, under these resurfacing. So those kinds of things, um, you know, hopefully we we could be include those in in the cost. Of, of what's already going to be be done there. Um, some of the other roadway projects, some of the other street projects, um, there's grants available. Uh, what we show on Burns Avenue, that could be a candidate for a reconnecting communities grant, knowing that it separates. Um, you know, we have the, the schools um, along that corridor or within that area. And uh, you know, separated from residences along that along the along Burns. So we might be able to make a case for some of these uh, street projects to be eligible for federal grants, uh, such as the Reconnecting Communities or the Safe Streets for All uh, grant program. Um, it's usually on an annual basis to do those. Um, the trails. You know, there's also federal programs available for the trails, the federal land ex federal lands access program, um, as well as um, some trail to be able to to look for some of those um, opportunities to fund trail networks uh, as well. I mean, one real important bottom line feature here is a couple of years ago, the city adopted that mobility plan so they could collect impact fees on new development and the fees that are paid into that are to pay for improvements to uh, that make it easier to walk and bike and use transit. So if there's a little bit of development, then there will be a little bit of money. And if there's a lot of development, there will be more money to use for that. But it's 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 being driven by uh, the new develop new construction permits for new new homes and, and the like. So that's a really important proactive move the city made. They're not, they're not just waiting on outsiders to come save them with grants. Although the city's gotten quite adept at explaining why Lake Wales Connected um, and presumably Lake Wales Envisioned make the city a good candidate for supporting with grants. It's coming right up on five o'clock. So we're going to stay and continue to answer questions as they come in. But um, if anyone does have to drop off, I wanted to just give a quick reminder. You know, all the work we've been doing um, since the charrette and with these um, deep dive check-ins has been working towards uh, you know, a, a, our community update meeting, which is going to be on July 11th. So it's going to be an in-person meeting at the Austin Community Center at 6 p.m. at night. And we're going to, you know, have updates on, you know, everything about Lake Wales Envisioned, you know, not just transportation and the environment, but all of the pieces all together. Um, so I hope to see many of you um, whose names I see here today um, in person then. Um, and if you have any questions that weren't answered, if you you know sit up in the middle of the night and you want to send us a question, you can go at any time to the Lake Wales Envision website and um, send your questions and feedback through the, the comment form on the website there. And we'll get those and we'll be able to uh, answer them. So I uh, just wanted to put those in really quick in case folks uh, need to drop off uh, at any time. But um, in the meantime, I, I see there's a lot of um, uh, information in the chat going back and forth um, a bit about um, three lanes versus four lane roads and um, this idea of, um, you know, when do, when do roads need to be four or five lanes? When can they be narrowed? And concerns about if an uh, existing road, if there's more development happening, maybe you don't want to reduce the capacity because there's more development. So maybe, Wade, can you talk a little bit about like how that decision is made, like what are the criteria that you look at as a as transportation engineer when you start to think about, you know, making a, a, a five lane road into a, 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 you know, if it's possible to make it a three lane or, you know, what are what kinds of things you look at? Yeah, Amy, and, and you know, I, I can give generalities because every street is is a little different based on what's along it, how many intersections it has whether or not there's signalized intersections and how many of them there are. Because one of the things, one of the things that's important to know about um, streets that have signals is that the capacity is the, how much traffic that street carries and the amount of congestion that you feel is really more related to those intersections than it is about the space, the, the configuration of the street. So, Usually that delay is, that vehicle delay and throughput is controlled by those signalized intersections. So when we start talking about three lanes versus five lanes versus four lanes, um, just remember that, that if there's signals, 
that's really where the, the bottlenecks start to occur um, on those as well. Um, as far as the idea of two travel lanes versus four travel lanes, and I'll leave the, the turn lane out of the equation for just a second. Um, you know, we, we regularly see um, two lane streets can carry as much as 20 to 25,000 vehicles a day, depending on a lot of those factors. But just rough numbers, one of the things that I do know is, uh, you know, Victor mentioned California. Um, I know one of the communities that we that we worked in in California had basically looked at, they had a criteria that if they were resurfacing a street and it carried less, less than 25,000 vehicles a day, they needed to do a more detailed analysis to see if it could be accommodated with two travel lanes instead of four so that they could add in uh, provisions for bicycles and pedestrians and, and all of the other things. Um, closer to home, Chattanooga actually has a very similar provision, but they set their their uh, they set theirs at twenty thousand, where they'll look at look at those streets. Again, context is going to dictate what you can do where and what kind of traffic that's that's uh, uh, carrying. However, you know, in the like in the case of Burns Avenue. Burns could easily accommodate what's the, the traffic that's there today and a lot more with a three lane configuration. So it's it's something that uh, it's not an exact science, but you know we we can get to each individual street, and of course we we want to look at that cl more closely as those decisions are made. There's another question that's asking about if there's any ideas about modal filtering. So, for example, restricting car traffic in some areas and having only pedestrians and bikes going through. And I don't know, Victor or Wade, if you want to speak to that idea. I'm going to say that I, we haven't necessarily talked about it. It can certainly be done. Um, one of you know a lot of the techniques that can be done um, are so rather than pre completely preventing auto traffic from coming through, you just make it difficult. So there are ways, uh, because you're still going to need to get emergency vehicles in and out, um, in and out of different uh, roadways. But this, the, uh, there's an idea called uh, bicycle boulevards, which actually look at really prioritizing bike traffic on more local streets uh, and deterring vehicle traffic. Um, so it just you through the use of things like traffic calming, uh, choke points, it just makes it um, makes it more a lot more difficult for vehicles to get through. Importantly, it also keeps vehicle traffic very slow to where they interact with the uh, the bicyclists. You just hit the main point right there, Wade, which is uh, that if people are going to come through the neighborhood because or you know near you because that's the a way to avoid a congested intersection. We might want to look at that intersection and see whether one of those modern roundabouts would have worked better than than a half circulating intersection and things like that. But if they are going to come through the neighborhood, then you want them to come through on the neighbor's terms, which is slow and safe. And you called that more difficult. I'm I'm saying that you as a driver, if you design it so that it looks like it's the natural, organic, normal thing to do would be to drive slowly. People drive slowly. It's not just a matter of putting a sign up that says, please drive more slowly. You have to design it for slow. I don't know if that's difficult, but it says you're coming through on the neighborhood's terms. Then last, if you have a network with a whole lot of web to it, a lot of intersections, a lot of uh, connections, let's call them, and you decide, well, this connection right here is gonna be pedestrian only, or this, this, in, this connection right here is gonna be ped and bike only, fine. You might say to the, that you want one little section of a street to be one way, and fine. If you have a lot of streets and a lot of intersections, you have some redundancy built in, then you can demote some of them to a less traffic status. That's exactly what's happened on Park Avenue, where the Park Avenue trail uh, is in the street alongside the one-way lane, instead of having two-way two travel for that segment alongside Crystal Lake Park. So I think that's an example of this filtering that was just described. I, it's a, a good... Uh, 
a good compromise. It doesn't encourage people to speed or to cut through, um, but it does allow for other ways of moving around. And while I've got uh, the mic for a second, I want to share my screen and just mention that um, we're starting to collect recordings like the ones we made today with Wade uh, and it, interviews and last week's session on uh, the Big Green Network and so on and load these into the YouTube channel and, uh, and make them accessible from LakeWalesAndVision.com. And one new one we have is a conversation uh, with Professor Joanna Lombard from the University of Miami. And what's interesting is she makes the connections between all the same things you mentioned, Wade, and public health outcomes, like uh, you know, tackling not just the, the danger in our streets, which do result in killing 40,000 people a year in this country, but also the widespread problems of uh, childhood obesity, early onset diabetes, uh, heart disease, and just people missing out on their daily uh, exercise, as well as mental health issues, all relate to street design. So if you're interested in this topic and want to take it to the next level, I would say uh, go to lakewellsandvision.com or to the YouTube channel and take a look at the interview with Professor Lombard. It's pretty interesting. Um, so we have just a couple more questions coming in here. And I see that um, Victor and Eric had been typing responses as well to some of these questions. So I'm trying to just scan through for the ones that have not been answered. Um, I see there's one here that says, um, I love the idea of pedestrian friendly. Can you elaborate on the concept of outdoor rooms and how they feel to the pedestrian, like tree-lined streets for shade or slow, slow speeds um, to not scare pedestrians in the beautiful street view? So I guess what are those things that you that are needed to support the pedestrian in the street space? Adequate sidewalk widths, good crossings, lighting. However, I will say that there's probably one thing that trumps everything in the in the state that we live in, and that's going to be shade. Um, if we can make sure, because we want it to be comfortable. So tree-lined streets um, can create the shade for the pedestrians. Um, also creates, again, creates that really good address uh, as well. But, um, you know, it, it's not just about walking along the street. It's about crossing the street and crossing a street such as, um, you know, what we were showing for uh, an idea for Burns Avenue uh, is much, much easier than it is not as not nearly as daunting as trying to walk across Highway 27. However, there's ways to be able to do that and to be able to accommodate that. So again, the right street in the right place and just really being able to make sure that the accommodation that we have fits the street that's there and what's around it as well. But I can't emphasize uh, enough the shade. <laughs> it's a question here. It says the vast majority of traffic in Lake Wales is transient traffic traveling through the city on Highway 27 and Highway 60. Uh, are you, will we be evaluating those roads for potential improvements and making recommendations to FDOT? When we start to talk about looking at improvements, um, improvements for who is, is what I would say. Is do, are, do we want to make sure that as residents, that we can get around. Um, can the can the residents and visitors to Lake Wales get around uh, easier and either in their car or out of their car? And so those are the things that we would be looking at: is how can we best accommodate that? And like Victor said, a robust network uh, can facilitate ways for locals to be able to get around. So every local trip that we, every one of those short local trips that we can take off of those corridors, um, you know, is room for those longer distance trips that, um, you know, that really don't, you know, we're happy for them to stop and spend money in Lake Wales, but um, if that's not their ultimate destination, they're, they're that longer trip. So, um, like I think, I think we said very early on, those kinds of uh, those kinds of streets were built not to facilitate local trips, uh, but to facilitate longer distance travel uh, related to you know uh, in, in, intra and interstate uh, travel. So either from the community to points outside or through the community, but from a local trip standpoint, 
being able to get to things and have choices about how you get there, whether you're going by car or being able to make the choice of not necessarily not even getting in my car it, it, it is really what we're what we're looking at in Lake Wales Envision. Okay. And with that, I think that was all of the questions. I see there's still some more chat going on in the chat, but if there's anything I missed, please um, raise your hand and um, feel free to, um, we can call on you to, to ask your question live. Um, but I think, I think that was all of the ones in the chat. So um, thank you so much, Wade, for, um, for your time today and uh, for this deep dive. It was uh, great information. And um, Victor, do you have any uh, last parting words? Just uh, to stay involved, I see several folks are ready, are in today in the in the web session that were also in last week. Come to July 11th. That's going to be an important in person occasion to check the work we have going on, up refined and added to since the work in progress after the charrette. Um, this all depends on people, and it's all about Lake Wales deciding what it wants to be when it grows up. So you are showing up by being here on the webinar and. Um, if you keep doing that, then you'll have a profound influence on what your city commissioners ultimately want to adopt. Your city staff is on is monitoring these sessions and, and helping set this all up too. This is a very interactive process. So I'll ask uh, city manager James Slayton, do you want to uh, add any final parting words? Give us a benediction. Hit the mute button. There you go. I'll just say it, it was a great uh, presentation and um, we, we can't wait for the implementation steps because uh, we, we want to get this done. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.